Good evening and welcome back to Italian Military Archives. This is our 12th live, the third live show uh, in English we are having so far this year, almost uh, uh, after one year of life of this channel. And this evening we have another special guest, which I will bring him on screen right, right now. We have uh, Matthew Willis, uh, his naval aviation historian, who has recently published uh, a book uh, from with, with Osprey, Osprey Publishing. The book is about uh, British torpedo bombers versus uh, Axis warship. And as you may have noticed from the, the title, today we will cover the, uh, the, ac the actions, actually the early actions in the Second World War between the fleet the, the fleet air arms the royal navy in general but with a specific focus on the fleet air arm and of course the, the italian navy the, the regia marina so good evening matthew how are you i'm very well uh, uh thank you very much for for having me on the on the show and uh looking forward to to talking more about it so uh you have published a book on the mm -hmm. with a very specific focus so would you like to tell us uh, something about it, then we can go and follow the, the timeline of events and dig deeper into the actions. Sure. Um, well, it's it's um, part of the very well-established Osprey Duel series, um, in which, which focuses on uh, two protagonists um, in, in conflict. So, so those can be quite specific or quite general. In, in this case, uh, we have the, the Royal Navy uh, torpedo bombers, carrier-based torpedo bombers, I should say, um, although not always operating from carriers, against Axis warships, um, mostly meaning in this context surface warships. Um, so we look at... Uh, the uh, the torpedo bombers in in their sort of in their best known and some of their lesser known uh, attacks against um, Axis warships some of the bigger ones that, uh, that against the battleships against smaller surface ships uh, not going into the sort of anti submarine operations and and um, uh, convoy protection operations very much the sort of open sea fleet action uh, kind of stuff um, so we. We look at uh, the Battle of Taranto. We look at the operation against the Bismarck um, and the things like the Channel Dash, but also some of the lesser known operations that, that that don't really get looked at, which I think are very interesting in the way that they they fit into the whole history. Yeah, and uh, talking about obscure and uh, lesser talked uh, actions, uh, I would like to to begin exactly from this because we talk mm. about Taranto we talk about other actions but uh, we talk about the Battle of Calabria uh, but uh, in the summer of 1940 the very first uh, skirmishes between the um, the Royal Navy and the Fleet Air Arm and the uh, the Regia Marina mm. are a series of uh, torpedo bomber attacks against uh, small Italian ships basically uh, destroyers and torpedo boats based in the Libyan harbors, Tobruk and Benghazi, uh, to name a few. And these are very interesting because also they provide the training ground for Taranto, isn't it? Mm. Th this is very much how I see it, yes, um, where they, they appear to be quite sort of small scale in, in some ways. But um, when you look into the operations in the way they were planned and the way they were carried out and the sorts of problems that they faced, um some of them were quite successful in themselves um some of them were less successful than they might have been but the interesting thing for me is that that each time you see them finding um finding the problems and working on ways to to try and surmount those problems which later are, are all kind of combined into the attack on the fleet anchorage um at taranto um so i mean it's important to say, I think, that um, that, that when uh, when Italy comes into the war against uh, against Britain and France in in June 1940, um, this is quite a blow to the Royal Navy um, because they weren't expecting to to have to fight Italy. They weren't really planning to fight Italy at the time. They had their hands full elsewhere. Um, so and and. and 
they'd 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 had big losses uh, in the Norwegian campaign from April to June 1940, um, and uh, and some losses over Dunkirk and and places like that as well. So they're very much sort of building up from from having taken a bit of a bruising uh, and from not having been terribly successful in those earlier um, conflicts. So um, certainly by by sort of early July. Um, 1940. Um, I mean, shall we sort of just continue and, and talk about this this sort of first no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. first attempt? Let's continue. No, no, continue, please. Sure, sure. Um, well, at the time, you have uh, in the in the eastern Mediterranean, um, HMS Eagle, um, which is a, an old aircraft carrier. Um, it was commissioned in 1918. Uh, it was based on uh, on the hull of a battleship um, mm -hmm. for the Chilean Navy, which was uh, which was sort of se seized is probably the wrong word. It was appropriated and and, and built into a, an aircraft carrier right at the beginning of the the history of, of that mm -hmm. form of naval aviation. Um, and as a result, it, it was not at the state of the art at all. It was it was very small for an aircraft carrier. It was rather slow. Um, it didn't have much capacity for aircraft. Um, it didn't have very good protection. Um, but this was all that the the Royal Navy had in the um, in, in that half of the Mediterranean at the time, which was um, operating out of Alexandria. Um, so that was what they had to work with. Um, which 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 wasn't a great deal um and so they were building up building up knowledge building up experience um and um there were some reports they started to receive reports of um destroyers and merchantmen in in the various harbors along the the, the, the north african coast um and were, were taking kind of decided to take sort of opportunistic action to try and um use their strength in in carrier based torpedo bombers to to try and erode some of the italian navy strength um the first one of these um on the 5th of july uh, was against um shipping in tobruk they received some uh, reconnaissance reports of of shipping in tobruk harbor um and so nine swordfish uh, from 813 squadron um which were well, they weren't flying from HMS Eagle at the time they they'd been disembarked to Sidi Barani where they could right. take uh really where they they could sort of take rapidly take advantage of, of reconnaissance reports of of shipping in harbor further along the coast and they were led by uh, lieutenant commander Nicholas Kennedy um who was the the squadron commander of 813 uh, squadron um and so they they found several destroyers uh, and and merchantmen uh, and they sank the destroyer uh, Zafiro, um, and the the destroyer um, Euro, I yeah. believe, had to be yeah. beached. Um, and and at, I think one merchant was sunk, and two were damaged. Mm. Um, for for I think no no loss in in the swordfish. So it was obviously not a huge blow to the Italian navy, um, but it was um, you know it, it was a success. It deprived the Italian navy of two uh, two destroyers um, and, uh, and and a merchantman, and you know some damage that had to be repaired. And so this was kind of a first score chalked up for the for the fleet air arm against against the Italian navy. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite soon after after hostilities commenced. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned uh, the um, the fact that uh, two destroyers were sunk, and actually Italy entered the war with fifty nine destroyers. So mm. even two sunk in the very early stages of the war, it's a problem because uh, Italy cannot sustain us the same level of attrition as the British can do. So at mm. some point uh, later in the war, there will be uh, let's say a destroyer crisis, in which there there will there will take destroyers out of the fleet escort, the battlefield escort, mm. to escort uh, the the convoys destined to Libya. So the, the destroyers were very, very valuable for, for, for the Italian Navy. Yeah. And yeah, actually, I have a question for you. These uh, mm. early attacks, the, the torpedo used in these attacks, were deploying the magnetic fuse, magnetic fuse, or they were contact fuse. The the uh, the very early ones were the contact fuse. Okay. Um, okay. Which was um, again, this was, uh, and again, I think which which 
these issues, I mean, you kind of think that actually, oh, well, you know, attacking ships in harbour is shooting fish in a barrel. It's easy. Actually, it's not. There are all kinds of problems, um, particularly for torpedo aircraft, which which have to be worked out. And these are, are some of the problems that the fleet air arm has faced, particularly in, in Norway, places like that. But trying to, where the water is shallow, torpedoes traditionally need a certain amount of depth to, to work mm -hmm. properly and this is why you mentioned the magnetic fuse which will be which will sort of come into the story a little bit later but um, um, you've got to set them to run at a certain depth what tends to happen is they they go into the water and they, they dive down and then they have to kind of come back up again to their operating depth so uh, so you need a bit more water than is actually the depth that you're, you're setting them to run in so there are compromises there um, you know, it compromises how the aircraft can can drop the, the torpedo, mm -hmm. which may or may not make it more vulnerable to uh, to defensive gunfire and things like that. So, so there's a lot of stuff to be worked out, and it's actually, you know, for them to be able to sink sort of two sort of shallow draft ships like this is is quite, um, you know. And again, you have to you have to decide what sort of target you're going for and set the torpedo to run at the appropriate depth. Which, you know, if you're hoping to run into to battleships, you you want the torpedo to be set for you know yeah. significantly deeper than if you're going for a torpedo for going for a destroyer um and obviously you don't want to with a contact fuse if you miss you miss that's that so um you, if, if the torpedo is too deep or the the waves are too deep and and it it, it makes the torpedo run un, under the the shot or it might strike the bottom mm -hmm. um and beach so you know, these are the kinds of problems that they face. But yeah, at the time they're using the, the, the contact fuse, which is reliable, but it, it compromises the the actions quite a lot. Yeah, because the, I was asking because the uh, we often talk about the depth of the um, the shallow water, the shallow waters of Taranto where mm. uh, I think around uh, 15 meters deep, uh, something like that in the area. Mm of the uh, anchorage of the Cavour, of the of the battleships yeah. so uh, and they were also um, going below the uh, the the torpedo nets the torpedo yeah. nets reached like 10, 10 meters deep yeah. and the yeah. torpedoes were able to pass beneath like half a meter below the, the nets and exploding below the kill so that caused yeah. uh, uh, several damage especially to the rebuilt uh, Battleship. But then yeah. the, I imagine, I don't know the, the exact data on the depth of the Libyan harbors, but I, I mm. don't think they were deeper than 10 meters. So yeah, this torpedo have to be released at a very low altitude to, to not sunk, to not sink in the in the bottom of the sea. Yeah, um, and I don't have any, um, I, I haven't seen any reports about you know whether the torpedoes, whether they had any problems with them beaching, which they certainly did in in uh, in Norway. Um, but I c I can imagine that 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 was probably the fate of of several of the torpedoes that were. Um, you know, you consider you had nine aircraft, um, all of them launched torpedoes, um, and um, well, well, I think in this case it was actually they probably got something like five hits, which is pretty good. So. Um, you know, normally you wouldn't, even in a, an attack on a harbour, a defended harbour, you wouldn't expect to get that many hits. But, um, you know, it, it was so three to, you know, f perhaps four mm. um, out of nine aircraft, which is which is good going. Um, yeah. And then um, so there were several similar raids like like mm. this one, some at night, um, some during the day, um, which. which mostly had sort of similar levels of, of success so uh you know should we talk about um augusta a little bit uh or are you still um yeah because so, you know there was a second raid on tobruk um on the 20th of of july um so there were reports of um but yeah no sorry we'll got i see you've got pancaldo there let's let's talk yeah. about um augusta. So you, you said augusta yeah yeah I did, I did. Um, I, I'm jumping around. I, forgive me, I have ADHD, so um, I, I, my mind tends to jump from from place to place, not terribly helpfully. But uh, <laughs> just just yeah. warn you. Yeah, just to give um, uh, some yeah. context to our uh, to our audience, Augusta is a naval base in Sicily, which was attacked. Uh, I think the, the evening or the day after the Battle of Calabria, right? Yeah. 
That's right. So there'd been a naval engagement, uh, a, a, a fleet engagement, um, albeit quite a sort of short um, one, but which I dare say we'll we'll come to that a bit later when we're talking about the fleet engagements. Um, but um, there were reports from reconnaissance reports uh, from an RAF flying boat that, um, that after this battle, um, a number of uh, cruisers and destroyers had put into Augusta to refuel um, on their way back to, to the main fleet anchorage in, in, um, in uh, Italy itself. And this was within range of uh, Eagle's swordfish. Um, so they decided to, to lay on it. They, they, they'd actually, earlier in the day, they'd missed uh, during the fleet engagement they hadn't scored any any torpedo hits so this was a good opportunity to try and um, make up for that um, that that failure somewhat um, so they sent again um, so the same commander Lieutenant Commander Kennedy uh, nine swordfish again which was about as many as as Eagle could could launch in one go um, and uh, so they crossed the uh, uh, crossed over to Sicily to arrive just after mm -hmm. sunset. Um, yeah. The idea being that, that this time they would they would try a, 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 an attack in darkness to uh, um, um, to avoid some of the defensive um, issues from uh, from the, the, the gunfire from the ships, the gunfire from the shore and so on. Um, by this time, however, the uh, the Italian Navy had received uh, uh intercepted radio reports that, that let them know that the aircraft were on their way so they the, most of the larger ships had left uh there were only two ships left in in the harbor uh which were how we how we um classify them i'm not quite sure i think they were probably considered large destroyers by this time the uh the, um, the navigatory class destroyers mm. were built as uh exploratory which is uh, scouts or scout cruiser but mm. for let's say international standards they were destroyers but mm. in fact the, the italian them the italians themselves they downgraded them to destroyers in 1938 Right, right. But they were quite large by destroyer standards, and they had been rebuilt, I think, and modernized. Um, yeah, so, they received the uh, clipper bow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, but anyway, so the, t two of these uh, two of these large destroyers in the harbor. One was anchored in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the harbor, having refueled. Um, another one was was tied up at the mole, still refueling. Refueling. Uh, this was uh, Ugolino Vivaldi. Um, was the mm -hmm. one that was still tied up, and uh, Leone Pancaldo um, was uh, was the one that was anchored. And um, this this raid, I think, is quite interesting for 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 raising some of the problems that would later be addressed at Sorrento, uh, because if you read the reports from the the air crews at the time, there's a lot of confusion about what they they found in the harbour, <laughs> and uh, and and what they what they did when they were making the attack. Um, so the, they were all agreed that, that what they thought they found was one destroyer and, and a, uh, an oiler um, tied up at the mole, which actually was another destroyer, but they, they misidentified it. Um, and uh, the, the Kennedy, uh, the first aircraft, um, led his section in, they, they'd split into two sections, um, and launched his torpedo and saw an explosion, and he thought he had sunk the Pancaldo. Um, in fact, he, his report had sort of quite lurid, um, you know, sightings of, of seeing the, the destroyer break in two and sink and so on. And, and actually, his, his torpedo had missed completely and it had impacted on a, a, a bar or something like that and had, had, mm. had detonated. Um, so he, he, hadn't, he hadn't hit anything. Um, you know, other, air, other aircraft kind of thought they had um, thought they'd torpedoed the ship by the... Uh, that was um, the Vivaldi, but in fact, again, had you know one of the torpedoes had run into a cliff and, and blown up. Um, I think one one of the aircraft thought they'd seen a, a submarine entering the harbour and um, was looking for targets, couldn't find it, went back to look for the submarine. I don't know if the submarine was ever even there, um, but um, you know, it's, and several of the ships couldn't find a target and returned. Mm. And then one of the later ones coming in actually then did hit the um the pancaldo which i think he th either he thought it was sinking or he'd heard earlier you know he, when he came back he, he sort of 
he thought that that ship had already been torpedoed and and that he was just hitting it again yeah. um but actually you know as, as you see from the damage here it, it was hit amidships um i think it, it sort of it, it destroyed uh, all, all the sort of opportunity for damage control and, and within mm -hmm. something like 15 minutes it, it, it had sunk yeah. completely and was was sitting on the bottom uh, now the ship was actually raised later on um i think was it sort of a year it, or two later yeah it re-entered service i th i think at the beginning of 1943 uh mm. and i think it saw action during the tunisian campaign where it was eventually sunk for the, f yeah, <laughs> the last yeah. time <laughs> sunk again um yeah. but uh you know it was it pretty pretty severe damage um, that yeah. was done but obviously not um not so so severe that it, it couldn't mm. be rebuilt and and, and put yeah. back into service albeit sometime later yeah um and well mm, we mentioned uh, uh the battle of calabria which uh, mm. was i mean the, the raid on augusta was let's say the one of the aftermaths of the yeah. uh, battle of calabria so the battle of calabria is arguably the largest uh, um, naval battle fought uh, in the Mediterranean in the Second World War. Mm. Uh, I don't know if if we do not consider Leyte as a as a battle because Leyte I, I would consider the Leyte Gulf as a series of different engagements. Yeah, could yeah, be yeah, <laughs> the could be the biggest battle naval battle in the Second World War. Maybe yeah. If um... we uh, no, but me, me, but me is arguing it's more uh, uh, aircraft action, so it's debatable. But let's keep this yeah. discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, no. I mean, fr from a fleet air arm perspective, it's it, it's slightly less um, notable. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, again, this this sort of it, there are several of these op several of these occasions which are really potentially lost opportunities for the fleet air arm and i think yes there are lessons to be learned but they also show the limitations of mm -hmm. the fleet air arm as it is at yeah. the time and i think there is you know we talk about toronto a lot and we talk about the, the you know we talk about matapan as we'll come on to later and the sorts of successes that the fleet air arm has but i think it's important to point out that certainly at this point certainly in the eastern mediterranean um really it, they're they're struggling somewhat by just sort of having this this very small very old carrier that can only mm -hmm. operate a very limited number of aircraft and i think this is something that the fleet air arm suffers from throughout the war and and really only is less of an issue right at sort of towards the end of the war that that they're never really throwing enough aircraft yeah. at, at a a target to, to guarantee having enough success i think if i remember correctly during the the battle of calabria the the eagle flies like nine torpedo bombers which attack the italians so that yeah. makes the the uh with the intervention from the region aeronautica which is a, a, a mixed failure the, mm. the mm. that makes it that the first uh, aeronaval battle uh certainly in the mediterranean, mediterranean. Mm. In, the, in the mediterranean uh, yeah and uh but then you see the the, um, the contribution to the respective air forces and, and the, the the fleet aviation. It's yeah negligible as as you mentioned. Uh, yeah, I mean in terms of they they claim a couple of hits, they don't actually make any. No. Um, and um, but you know the the because the fleet air arm um, the the assumptions that they make is that that sort of in in good conditions um a an attack of 10 to 12 aircraft should should be expected to make one or two hit torpedo hits um which is you know reasonable and that's generally borne out um obviously in this case they're operating nine aircraft which is at the lower level um and also you know there's a swordfish they're very slow um, they're not very good at covering distance um, and um, you know they're, they're good torpedo bombers when they reach the target but but they can struggle particularly against faster ships which they tend to find in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. um, the Italian the one you know Italian ships are noted for being very fast for their class and and this does tend to um, be problematic for, for for very slow torpedo bombers particularly if they're they're in a stern chase and it's mm -hmm. against the wind and and they're you know they've, they've got a 30 plus knot ship that they're trying to, to to close the distance with um 
But um, yeah, so they they managed to launch two strikes um, of around you know nine aircraft. Um, they've got the problem for them is they've got to operate the the shadowers as well to try and keep the location of the Italian fleet, um, and they tend to need you know around four aircraft in the air at any one time to to keep the shadowers on station to 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 maintain the position of the Italian fleet. And this happens with mm -hmm. the first strike actually is that they the, sorry, this, I think it's the second strike, that they're, they're launching the strike and that's all their capacity. So they can't launch further mm -hmm. shadowers. So there's a gap in the, and then the, at this point, actually the, the Italian fleet changes course. And so they lose them for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and when, you know, time is a consideration, this is this, this is an issue as well. So this is the sort of limitations that they're, they're operating under. And I think that they're, they're doing good work. And it's pointed out that Eagle is, is sort of during this, engagement is operating at swordfish for nine hours constantly there's they're, they're always working on bringing aircraft up striking aircraft down yeah. um turning into the wind launching aircraft landing aircraft on and they're doing this for nine hours constantly with a very old ship that's kind mm -hmm. of worn out and um and you know frankly obsolescent aircraft that they don't have enough of so given that they've done well but they haven't actually hit any of the ships so mm -hmm. you know it's a lesson yeah. Um, and I think they probably regard this as disappointing. Hmm. But then this brings up brings us later to to Taranto, which uh, mm. uh, it's the culminating point. At the The Royal Navy has received a brand new air aircraft carrier, the mm -hmm. Illustrious, which allows to improve the the fleet air arm capacities and uh, carry more aircraft, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, all this training, this uh, experience gathered in the uh, in the previous months pay, pays off. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, I we, we have dedicated on this channel a live, an entire live on Taranto. So I encourage the, the our uh, listeners to to retrieve it. So, but what would you? Uh, so because this is not a live on Taranto. So what would you, mm. would you uh, underline uh, of this raid? Uh, from the perspective from your perspective from the perspective of the work you have done in your book yeah well i think i think for me the the important thing is to see it in its context as a culmination of this this earlier work that's that's gone on um and without those earlier raids um on augusta on tobruk um that the at um that they wouldn't have had the have experienced the kinds of problems um, that enabled them to then have, you know, really quite significant success um, at Taranto. And, and those were things like um, illumination. Mm -hmm. um, so they realized that they needed some kind of illumination and then did a lot of work with flares. So at Taranto, you had the situation where you had several aircraft flying along behind the fleet anchorage, dropping flares in order to silhouette the, uh, the battleships at anchor. Um, for the for the torpedo bombers that were coming in, and yeah. that worked reasonably effectively. Um, there was the idea of the the intelligence of actually being able to find out where the ships were located and what the defences were around there, um, and to put this kind of work in before you know, earlier in the war, there was a tendency to just kind of throw the aircraft out and hope, um, mm -hmm. re relying on earlier reports. And I think that was the thing with, with um, Taranto, was that once they, had, once they had the ability to get very accurate and timely reconnaissance reports um, from the Martin Maryland aircraft, which, which had recently become available, Mm -hmm. um which which were able to, to to go in and take detailed photographs without being intercepted or, or being at too much risk from the the defenses in the harbor uh, so that was that was important as well um they also had the long-range fuel tanks uh which arrived with illustrious which they didn't have before um so i think there are two elements one is they were building up all this knowledge and and experience to be able to put that tactically into operation and the other thing was the they didn't have some of these elements until mm -hmm. around september october uh, 1940 to be able to make this this raid on um taranto mm -hmm. and the other thing of course is that the defenses in the harbor were being built up so this was essentially a bit of a one-shot deal yeah. where the torpedo nets um would have been improved on later on the anti-aircraft guns would have been improved on later on the searchlights mm. and things like that so 
I don't know at what point, mm. but certainly much after the beginning of 1941, I, I can't see a raid like this mm -hmm. being having nearly as much chance of success. Yeah, because the 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 thing with with the the defenses of the base was that one around one third of the torpedo nets that were planned were actually mm. in, installed around the ships. Then they uh, opted for a um, a layout of the of the torpedo nets not surrounding each ship, but mm. Mm, just as a mm, la larger area. The, yeah. to to circumvent the ship this was meant to allow the the battle fleet to set it to um, to leave port quicker yeah but this was a drawback eventually for, for the, and then we mentioned before the the fact that the torpedoes were yes. passing beneath the, the torpedo nets which were not uh, uh deep mm. uh, enough because the I mean, this made sense because the, the Italians didn't know the magnetic the, the, the magnetic yeah. fuse. And uh, Taranto is, is the first time they used the magnetic fuse, or there were other occasions. Yeah. Uh, no, well, it's, it's to my knowledge, it's the first time that certainly the first major occasion on which it, mm -hmm. on which it was used, and they would they'd only recently become available, certainly in the in the Mediterranean. Um, so mm -hmm. this the duplex pistol they called it. Yeah. It's, a mag it's a magnetic fuse, um, and it enables the it enables the the torpedo to detonate on proximity rather than contact yeah. um and the benefit of this is um with well, the major benefit was seen as being able to, to detonate underneath a ship where it could um break its back where it, it would uh, most warships are essentially unprotected directly underneath thank you yeah um, <laughs> and um so you don't have things like the um, the armor, you don't have armor belts, you don't have the Pugliese system, which was mm. was fitted to the um, the Italian battleships. It bypasses all of that and it cannot um, detonate where the the ship is is most vulnerable. The other thing, yeah. as you mentioned, was the torpedo nets. So you can set the torpedoes to run a little deeper, and they go underneath the nets. I think yeah. in the case of um, Taranto, actually the torpedo nets weren't quite as deep as the the keel of the uh, the battleships. Uh, I remember that uh, the, the the they reached ten meters be uh, ten meters um, deep. Mm. The dro the drought of the Cavour and Duilio class battleships were similar. The right. the Litorios, uh, had a, a, a bigger drought, but mm. I don't remember it by heart. But yeah, the yeah, thing is, yeah. the in fact, you see from the from the damage that they received the. The torpedo hit on the, the torpedo hits on the Duilio and on the Cavour, they mm. uh, they they explode. The torpedo explodes beneath the keel and causes a lot of damage. Yeah. The 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 Duilio is beached. Uh, the Cavour, the, the, the there's an argument be, between an admiral and the commander. They they lose time and eventually they are mm. um, they give the order to beach the ship not not in time. If you uh, see the damage on the Littorio, it actually uh, struck the, the Pugliese system. Yeah. No, the, the extreme of the Pugliese system with the first hit, uh, while the third and the second hit are um, hitting areas outside the yeah. torpedo defense system, but they're not be beneath the keel. And maybe this yeah. is also uh, one factor that, uh, in a way, facilitated the work of the Italians, because if the damage uh, had uh, if the explosion had occurred beneath the kill, that would have been um, a bigger problem to raise the yeah. ship again. Yes, um, I think, um, and it would have probably taken um, greater resources to, to to put it back mm. into action. I would have, yeah. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think so. Those, the, and I think the um, yeah, so the the hits on on the the older rebuilt battleships were were duplex fuse hits mm -hmm. um, that 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 were underneath the the keel. Um, the the ones on the Littorio were were less serious hits, um, but um, obviously they still caused a lot of flooding. Um, mm -hmm. But they they weren't quite so um, structurally damaging. <laughs> The, the the funny thing is m many I've seen uh, in the past many people criticizing the, the Pugliese system for this failure but actually if you uh, take the the six torpedo hits that uh, the the Littorio and the Vittorio Veneto have received in the war yeah. actually one only one uh, hits the the ships 
in the area covered by the police system. Another mm. one, uh, like the second hit uh, here at Taranto, hits the the extreme, uh, the extreme yeah, part yeah. where the the ceiling there is uh, is smaller. So you mm. have to so. so this, the system is less effective. But the problem is that the first two hits on the Littorio didn't compromise the ship. The problem uh, came with the with the second, uh, with the third hit, sorry, mm. and that caused a lot of flooding. And then there was uh, um, le- a, a, a small design flow in uh, in the Littorio. So you had the some of the electric cables of the uh, of the pumps of the water pumps were not mm. uh, waterproof. So this this water infiltration caused a uh, blackout, <laughs> and yeah. uh, the major uh, the biggest pumps on the on the ship were not able to pump out the water, so they couldn't counter the flooding, and they ordered the. Uh, they, they, they brought the ship uh, to to the shallow waters uh, in the in the north of the bay. This experience actually uh, was very valuable because uh, improved uh, they, they fixed these design flaws and proved a good experience for later for Matapan during mm. um, the action of uh, uh, what we call it Matapan. It's but it's more complex uh, <laughs> operation. Yeah. The where the Torre Vento was hit and we will see it later. The the mm. The damage control worked uh, perfectly on the on the Vittorio Veneto, and they were able to put uh, the ship back in action uh, in a space of half an hour or one hour. I don't remember. Mm. And it, but you know, considering the amount of flooding there was uh, on that occasion, um, yeah. and sorry, for, sorry again for jumping ahead. I think for no, no, considering that that putting it getting a moving again and mm. you know at, at significant speed and then being able to escape i think yeah. was was a real testament to the um the qualities of the ship and and the the, the defense system but but any any torpedo defense system becomes it, it lessens towards the ends of the ship um mm-hmm. so i think this is a lot of attacks on the Pugliese system are, are, are kind mm. of uh, you know yeah. any any torpedo defense system i think the, the the big issue of it for me is the space it takes up which is less of an issue for italian mm. navy ships anyway but yeah because if they have to operate in the mediterranean they need uh, less space for the for the fuel tanks so they could afford it in a way and overall yeah. they prove to be resistant ship i mean torpedo magnets for sure but uh, they endured Mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah quite but uh, you know the fact that well uh, <laughs> um in terms of their survival throughout the war i don't think they did too badly really um but uh, considering the if, one that's if you also consider uh, um the torpe- the police system proved also instrumental to the resist uh, to the explosion uh, of the fritz x uh, bomb mm. that uh, exploded near the um, the italia so the, the former littorio that was renamed italia uh, the the bomb penetrated the upper deck then exited from the the ship side and then exploded mm. in the water and the explosion right. was very close and caused the 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 cracking of uh, I think two sections of the police system, mm. but then the ship went to Malta, then went to the Great Bitter Lakes, then uh, stayed there for a while. It received a very superficial patch up, but then in 1946 they came back to Italy and still it was never fully repaired. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I suppose it's peacetime economy for you, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so- the other thing I think is is they spread the fleet air arms spread themselves thinner than they needed to so i think in it, there's always this balance and you see this with with operations later on in the war that um that, mm-hmm. that they're trying to sort of maximize the success from the resource that they put into it and they decide that rather than put torpedoes on all of the aircraft that they send out that they'll um fit bombs to some and try and attack mm-hmm. the cruisers in the inner harbor um you know that that decision has has received some criticism later on yeah. really seeing as that there was no significant damage done to those ships they had two hits from armor piercing bombs but none neither of them exploded and then there's a question of well when you've got the battleship sitting there shouldn't you really just throw mm. everything at at, at at them and and um you know that's that's received some criticism later on i think this was a lesson that that the fleet air arm learned later on um with the attacks on the turpits mm. for one thing which which yeah. is is that if you try and 
sort of um trying to think of the word now but you're trying to sort of hedge your bets and try and sort of go for a multitude of different targets and and get and sort of balance a smaller amount of damage on a larger number of targets actually it didn't seem to yeah um, so reap because, any benefits uh, i mean this is a, a, a th i completely agree because if you have the battleship sitting there you you better use the uh, the torpedoes because if your goal is to uh deal the knockout blow to the italian navy you have mm. to go with the torpedoes i think and this brings to the to to a point that i always ra raise in the discussions over taranto i mean taranto is a uh, indisputable tactical success mm. Mm. the thing is it's a uh, it's a missed opportunity for the for the royal navy in a way because it doesn't knock out the the italian navy out of the war it mm. doesn't compromise its uh uh let's say its threat let's say because remember we have to remember that a week later you you have this myth that after taranto the the, the yeah. Italians uh, were uh, uh, were hiding in port but the week after the Vittorio Veneto and the Giulio Cesare sailed to intercept um, uh, an operation meant to launch uh, a fighter uh, aircraft to, to, to reinforce yeah. Malta. So the, it, it, the Italians continue to to, uh, to use the supply routes to Libya. To, in, in January, February, March, they, they transport the Africa Corps there. Mm -hmm. So strategically, it doesn't change uh, that much. I have a an opinion that what happens in Taranto has an impact on the uh, on Cape Sparty Vento that we will see yeah. in a while. Uh, but then we have to remember that uh, the, the Mediterranean remains blockade, blo uh, blockaded and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. the, the threat is still there. So yeah. if they went with much more torpedo bombers, that would have probably changed comp the, 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 the course of the war in the Mediterranean. Yeah, I mean, there was the opportunity there. As it was, it didn't change anything major. Um, it, you know, it wasn't a strategic um, victory, really. It was. Um, it, it was. It was important. Um, it. Um, it helped the Royal Navy somewhat, mm -hmm, um, and I think in terms of the, in the the, the later prosecution of the war it was sort of it was part of a sort of attritional um you know grinding down of that but then you know both navies were kind of grinding each other down mm -hmm, um, sure. and failing to to land a knockout blow um later on of course um you know and also we have the situation i think where it's it's necessary if you're going to strike a knockout blow it has mm -hmm. to be now it has to be early for yeah. the royal navy um, for various reasons, one of which is, you know, defences at Taranto are improving. Um, another one is that, that the Admiralty doesn't really believe that it's possible for sustained operation of aircraft carriers in the eastern Mediterranean, that they just won't be able to survive um, for, for longer than a relatively short period. And it, this does end up being the case, really, when you, you think that, that, I mean, Eagle, um, Eagle survives, um, but um, you know is is pretty worn out and has to to go home. Mm -hmm. um, illustrious, which has just arrived. I mean, actually, that's that's another factor is that it, that that Taranto could have been bigger because it was meant to incorporate both carriers. Mm -hmm. um, but Eagle had um, you know, developed faults within with her aviation fuel system because of near misses that she she'd taken from bombs from um, from the Reggio Aeronautica. So. Um, in a sense, the Reggio Aeronautica <laughs> managed to mission yeah. kill, yeah. You know, managed to erode the success of Taranto. And I don't, you know, I don't think we should underestimate that. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was it was kind of an Italian success. Didn't realize it at the time, mm. but everything in the Mediterranean <laughs> war is connected. And, and yeah, at, yeah. At an amazing level. It's uh, that's so fascinating. You know, it's it's it's, it's yeah. this sort of arterial war of convoys, um, and, um, and and the sort of the north south arteries that have to be kept open for, yeah. for Italy's war and the east-west arteries that have to be kept open for the Allies' war. And it, it's all about that. Um, so as you, you say, everything is connected. Um, and every little action has an impact on on things further on.
down the line. Thinking about little actions, uh, mm. I fo we forgot to mention the uh, bomba. We did, yeah, bomb. and that was that yeah, just then, occurred to me. Yes, uh, yeah, I wanted to bring it up because I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, thing. So, uh, for those of you uh, that don't know, there was uh, there were actually two attempts. Uh, to raid Mal, to raid uh, Alexandria with uh, human torpedoes before the famous raid of December 1941. The very first one was attempted in uh, August 1940 with uh, the submarine Iride carrying three uh, human torpedoes of the 10th MIS flotilla, which at the time was known as the, the first uh, MIS flotilla. And there were uh, the, the Iride had to link up with um, a support ship uh, and a destroyer in the Gulf of Bomba, which is uh, east of uh, Tobruk in Libya. And uh, they were in the in the course of transferring the the, the human torpedoes and the personnel on the on the Iride to um, cover the the final uh, trade between uh, Bomba and Alexandria. And they were attacked by uh, uh, swordfish torpedo bombers, right? Mm. Yes. Um, so this was another one of these cases of these opportunistic raids that were were um, taken by um, the aircraft from Eagle that had been uh, disembarked to. I can't. I haven't got that noted down. Um, but um, but yeah, these, these were aircraft. I think eight two four squadron. Um, the, the the other squadron that was uh, based on on Eagle, who were led by uh, the Royal Marine Captain Ollie Patch. Um, and this was another one of the cases of, of one of these raids where they were were based there, hoping to sort of pounce on reconnaissance reports of of shipping off the the Libyan coast. And they received a report uh, of a couple of destroyers and uh, a, a a support a submarine and a support vessel so they they set off um and um uh, you know found these vessels kind of sitting there and there wasn't an awful lot they could do and and uh you know a, a, a section of the aircraft went in straight at the the iride um another section sort of went round the back and and came in at the monte gargano which is the the support vessel uh there was a torpedo boat there the calypso i believe um yeah, correct. which um I, I think i don't know if they were one of the aircraft launched at that but i don't think they hit it um or maybe there was slight damage or something but um but yeah so they the submarine just broke in two and sank um and uh and the support vessel too i i don't know what the sort of i mean the, this this became this was sort of really celebrated you know slightly unfairly in uh, in royal navy circles because once again with this kind of confusion over target identification and, and acquisition somehow they thought they'd managed to sink four ships with three torpedoes um because some of them were quite close together and you know you see explosions and and um yeah you know, water spouts and things like that. And and this was kind of, the, they came back. I think probably because the, the later reconnaissance reports suggested that, 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 that all four vessels that they saw had, had been sunk. Uh, um, I, be, I believe that the, the Italian ships were sighted by bombers that were coming back from a bombing mission and they were spotted the Italians for randomly. <laughs> they signaled their presence, they sent reconnaissance aircraft and then they sent the bombers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this was this tended to be how how these these things happen. And I think why they they liked to um, disembark some of the swordfish when when um, Eagle wasn't on a cruise to um, um, to take advantage of, of some of these reports, because they could be um, they could be responded to quite quickly and they could get aircraft mm. in the air. And even with the slow speed of the swordfish, they could they could yeah. get there within reasonable time to uh, not always as we found out with Augusta but um, you know most particularly with the ones along the Libyan coast they, they generally could get there um, in time to um, the, the, the reconnaissance reports weren't out of date uh, so yeah and I think they had no idea at the time that of the significance of this submarine that yeah. sunk, <laughs> um, which um, I, I think again was was to me this was sort of potentially an opportunity to Mm -hmm. to shift the balance of, of power in in the Regia Marina's favour, um, yeah. whether or not it would have, have worked out. But it certainly, whether it could have flipped Taranto, who knows? 
Yeah, the thing is, I, I, to, I think I told you the last time we spoke that uh, mm. uh, that was the very first attempt uh, by the Italians uh, using this kind of weapons. And given the uh, outcome of the subsequent human torpedo attacks uh, in 1940, 1941, which collected... Uh, good amount of failures because they had still had to fix the human torpedoes they were malfunctioning and so on they they later developed the, the cylinders to carry the, the human torpedoes yeah. if they really had arrived before alexandria i'm skeptical that they would have managed to 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 accomplish the mission given what we have seen uh later mm. you never know it's a, it's an interesting what if yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's sort of one of those things that <laughs> actually had it potentially anyway had a had a bigger yeah. impact than 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 it appeared. It was it seems a little bit like, you know, it's a mm -hmm. because it's a of good course success, it, but... it means it means that for a Royal Navy you have to move naval more naval assets to the Mediterranean and then you are yeah. uh giving more roof, room for maneuver to German raiders in the Atlantic so that everything is connected again <laughs> absolutely yeah absolutely and this is um you know this, for the royal navy there's this constant sort of shifting around of, of resources and never quite having enough um for um uh, for what it wants to do uh and this is true in terms of of carriers and aircraft um uh as well as as well as in battleships and and mm -hmm. resources like that and i think there is this you do get the sense that there's constantly this sort of um, struggle to try and get enough battleships in the Eastern Mediterranean to 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 to, to balance the Italian fleet. Even after Taranto, this this is an issue. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we have uh, we made a jump back. Now we make another jump forward. Yeah. And so I apologize. After... <laughs> yeah. No. No. That was my bad. <laughs> I forgot about the the. the... So after Taranto, uh, after two weeks, uh, the, there's another clash, which has um, an aviation uh, side, which is mm -hmm. the clash of Spartivento. So long story short, there's an operation to uh, move uh, naval forces to the Force H because Taranto has half the, the Italian battlefield strength. So the, the, the British since they are uh, of a stretch uh, across the Mediterranean and the Atlantic, managed to um, pass uh, transfer some naval assets uh, to the to the west, and uh, there, there's also um, a minor resupply operation of, uh, towards Malta going on. So in in the Italians are aware of this. They uh, leave port with uh, most of their heavy cruisers and the only two battleships available and they uh, the two fleets encounter uh, each other south of Sardinia the from the Italian side uh, uh, especially after after the clash this was seen as a, a lost opportunity because the balance for some was not that much uh, uh, in favor of the British so the the, the Italians could um, could gamble in this clash but the thing is uh given the directives that uh, admiral campioni had so that he, he had to engage only on favorable terms and having in mind what happened two weeks before at taranto with the uh, attacks of the torpedo bombers he knew that he had two battleships two battleships only one uh, modern battleships and he was facing uh, an R class battleship and the uh, the renowned the HMS Renown. So let's say um, even let's say uh, even on capital ships. But then there was the aircraft carrier. He had an advantage on, on heavy cruises, but he uh, he has he considered that this was not uh, a fight on favorable terms, and he decided to disengage. But the order arrived a bit uh, late. Uh, and in the meantime, the, heavy, the Italian heavy cruisers under uh, Admiral Iacchino uh, engaged uh, the, the British cruiser, and this was the gunfire action of the of this clash, let's say. But there is even a, a, a torpedo bomber attack, right? Yeah, um, and um, I think there, there were uh, well, there were several strikes launched. Um, there, there was, I think, probably things were 
somewhat confused on the uh, on the on the British side, um, just trying to work out exactly which forces they were facing and where they were facing them. And actually, there's a remark that uh, that Admiral Somerville made in his in his report that uh, initially, when he got reports of of the the Italian battle fleet, he, he was skeptical that that was what was being reported. He thought that perhaps it was his own ships of of or um, of the Mediterranean fleet um, that were being reported in error because he was surprised to see the uh, the Italian fleet as far west as as it was. So that kind of delayed his actions slightly um, because he Somerville had actually um, spent some time with the Italian Navy in the First World War. Mm -hmm. um, so so he sort of you know he was basing his thinking on on the the way they were operating. So but I think it also does show that. Um, th th that that uh, Campioni was was operating quite boldly, quite energetically, less than a month after Taranto. Um, so you know it was um, certainly putting his ships where they were, um, uh, sort of in terms of uh, their the level of support they could expect from land based aircraft and that kind of thing. Um, but but yeah, so there was a, there were strikes launched. Um, actually, I mean Ark Royal in this case um, is. It's at the time the only the only British carrier that that really can accommodate a, a really decent number of aircraft, like about fifty aircraft or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, which is is so it, it has a bit more freedom in terms of being able to launch larger strikes um, that that we talked about. Um, they also have some dive bombers. They've got some Blackburn skewer dive bombers, which are sort of have to act as fighters sometimes. But they also they can carry a 500 pound semi armor piercing bomb, which mm. you know has sunk a few ships um, already in the war. So, um, so yeah, so they send out um, they send out a strike, which I think claims a hit on one of the battleships, but actually hasn't hasn't scored yep. any hits. Um, this again affects thinking later on because Somerville thinks that they've hit one of the battleships, uh, where, whereas in fact they haven't. Um, they then get reports of a uh, of a disabled cruiser, which I think is actually a disabled destroyer. Yeah, um, it was the launch uh, 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 Yeah, um, so they they're, they're trying to look for that and trying to send a force um, to uh, to to attack that. Um, they fail to find it, um, but they actually. Um, then find the British torpedo bombers, the second strike, then they find some Italian cruisers and they attack those and they don't hit them either. Um, and then the, there's a strike of dive bombers, which goes out sort of quite late in the day, which is looking for the disabled cruiser, which is actually a destroyer. And they find some other cruisers and attack those and think they've scored a hit. And I believe the, the Italian Navy initially reports that there's that the cruise has been hit but then downgrades that to near misses so I think they did slight damage to the Bolzano um, uh, later on in the engagement yeah if I remember it's pretty minor the, damage yeah I yeah think. yeah the Bolzano received light damage there was uh, I think I remember a claim from the British that they hit another heavy cruiser which was the yeah. fume eh? but right, then yeah. the the because they spotted uh, um a cloud of black smoke, yeah. but actually it was uh, a, a a minor fire that ignited uh, on, right, on the right. ship. But yeah. I think it was uh, due to the combustion of some uh, something. I, I don't remember. Oh, okay. It was yeah. A, a, yeah. A, a minor fire that right. was yeah. spotted by the British and they exchanged it for a for a hit on the on the cruise. Okay. And and this is, I mean, I, the, there's a hilarious report about the battle from Time magazine, um, which is is really kind of hyperbolic in the way that it's written. It's, it's I'll, I'll send that to you, but it's it's really quite um, funny in the way it's written. And the 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 they note that um, the Italian navy uh, brings it, it brings war sort of neutral war correspondents to to Taranto to look at the battleships and confirm that they haven't received torpedo hits from the British. Um, so I think they're, they're quite sort of annoyed by these reports. And they they report like 13 aircraft shot down, whereas actually it was one yeah. um, and, and things like that. So, you know, it was the actually... Propaganda war. <laughs> sorry? The propaganda war. Well, indeed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I think actually there was... But either side did very little damage to each other. I think there was... The, the, the cruisers got into action and, and there was a bit of, of kind of and as, as you mentioned, the uh, the, the destroyer, uh, which the, the British failed to find. Um, and also, you know, as you mentioned to me earlier, which kind of comes on to, to the, 
the later action at Matapan, where they leave the whole division of destroyers to to guard the withdrawal of this this damaged destroyer. Yeah. Um, and as it turns out, that that you know, it's not a problem because the the, the British don't locate them. So there's a lot of kind of groping around for for ships, mm -hmm. and I think because the Ark Royal hasn't been in as much of this kind of action as the we've talked a lot about the the Mediterranean fleet over in the Eastern Mediterranean with with Eagle and then Illustrious, uh, where they're getting a lot of experience. Um, Force H uh, with with Ark Royal hasn't had so much experience yet, so they make some slip ups and. And really, in terms of, you know, I think you mentioned that it was seen as a missed opportunity for the Italians. I think it's far more of a missed opportunity for the for the Royal Navy, really, because I think given the the the, the resources that they had available, they really ought to have been able to expect at least a couple of torpedo hits on some some major warships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this is an issue, and that the Ark Royal goes away, and 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 they do some some much more intensive training, which which does then assist them later on against the other axis side which we won't you know we're not we're not doesn't really um come into our discussion today but but again it's everything's connected so we can look at cape spartavento and and some of the lessons that were learned there that later fed into the bismarck um and some of those those actions there so um you know it's all it's all context uh, I have a question, maybe uh, about the hardware. Maybe before be, before going to the uh, to the later operation, we could uh, have a, uh, a dig we could dive a little bit deeper on the on the hardware. At this mm. point, uh, the the British were uh, happy or about the the performance of the swordfish, or they started to realize they needed a faster uh, torpedo bomber to strike ships at sea or mixed uh, views what was the, the situation yeah i think well there was there was already a sense from from some of these um the the engagements particularly the ones in open sea that that the performance of the swordfish was really hampering um the the nature of the the attacks and that it was it was just taking as i mentioned before it was taking too long to cover distances mm -hmm. um and it was you know if, if you were against if you were against fast ships it was very difficult for them to get into position because yeah. um torpedo bombers need to be able to get into into the, the the ideal position to attack they can't just sort of arrive over some ships uh, and and see the ships ahead of them and launch the torpedoes that's you know because that won't work they they need to be able to organize themselves uh the, the the classic attack is this kind of the i think the americans call it like a hammerhead attack or something like that but it's you, you have to try and position two forces of torpedo bombers off the bow of of the the ship that you're trying to attack the idea is that you try and get the captain to commit to a turn one way or the other before you launch your torpedoes because what the what the captain wants to do is to, to turn into the torpedo attack so the torpedoes mm -hmm. pass down either side of the ship yeah. uh, and, and so you present a smaller target and so you you know um mm. you're not presenting your flank but the idea is then that if you can get if you can get the captain to turn and you've got several forces coming in from different directions when he turns into one attack he's actually presenting his flank to another attack so this is mm. this is how they try and position things but with a slow aircraft mm. like the swordfish against fast ships like the italian ships it's very difficult to achieve mm. that um so yeah so there is an issue and we have uh, another aircraft um coming online around this sort of time it, it first came into service um, around the Dunkirk operation, mm. uh, but um, operating from land bases, and it's just getting onto the carriers now. So this is the Ferry Albacore, mm. which um, is a bit of a, an untold hero of the of the Second World War. I think it was I, I it's believe overshadowed so. by the the swordfish. <laughs> but yes, yeah, and I think you th there's a lot of there's a lot of myth making about the swordfish, uh, which feeds into the narrative about the. Um, the albacore i think there were a lot of assumptions about the albacore that it was a bad aeroplane because mm. um because the swordfish continued in in service longer than the albacore um and and you know it continued in production and it was the the one the swordfish was the aircraft that went into the battle of the atlantic but 
actually the albacore you know it was 20 miles now faster than the than the swordfish which you know actually makes quite a significant difference certainly in the context of the mediterranean um it has a bigger range so it can be launched at greater different distances and this this makes a this has a you know a, a quite a significant benefit um it's um it's slightly better well the crew is better protected they're in a uh, in an enclosed cockpit which is less of an issue in the mediterranean than than in other places but certainly in open cockpits you the efficiency of the crew tends to drop after a long period of time and one of those raids actually that, that we didn't quite get onto one of the the second one against the brook um was that it took the, the, the they were three hours flying over the target trying to identify and locate the targets uh, and when you're at night, you know, even in a in a sort of warmer climate like that, you know, the crews are getting cold and they're getting less efficient and they're, they're yeah. getting less able to carry out their duties. So an enclosed cockpit is actually kind of a big deal for, for you know, it's not just a sort of, it's, it's not just like a kind of modern um, convenience. It's actually does actually make a bit of a difference. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the, the albacore actually, it, its appearance, you, and you see this in some of the other, some of the, some of the battles later on, that it, it's, it's slightly improved performance does actually make a difference. And then I would like to add that uh, uh, the only times when um, Italian uh, ships were hit at sea by uh, torpedo bombers, one case is uh, Matapan, we will see in a while, mm -hmm. by a ferry albacore. Mm -hmm. And the other case was uh, a Buf, uh, Bufighter flown by the... From, from from Malta that hit the mm. uh, the Littorio in 1942. So and a, a very powerful airplane uh, capable mm. of, of high speed and maneuverability. So a, a, a different animal compared yes. to, uh, to the biplanes. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and again, it's it's sort of, um, yeah. Um, so the it, it is it's coming on stream around this time. It's it's. Uh, I mean, HMS Formidable has come out um, to replace. Uh, illustrious which was mm -hmm. damaged by um, severe axis air attacks in yeah. january 1941 um and was 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 mission killed was not sunk um but but it was it really really severe damage that, that really affected it for the rest of the war um and it had to to leave the theater and, and be replaced by by its younger sister um hms formidable yeah. which had uh, squadrons of albacores although so few albacores were available at this point that she had had to make good some of her losses with swordfish. So she still had a certain number of swordfish on board, mm. which would, would take part in some of these operations. Uh, I don't remember if this picture is the formidable or the indomitable. I don't remember, but I it's followed by the it, eagle. Yeah, yeah, eagle um, behind. So um, that would be in the pedestal operation, I think. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Probably, that... yeah. Probably this is from pedestal. Yeah. Yeah. If it's pedestal, then it will either be victorious or um, or indomitable, mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember which. And my identification is not sufficiently good um, <laughs> to uh, to tell you exactly which. Who will work which on one this? That is. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It should it should be, but yeah. um, but you know. Um, it's a very Brief. famous photograph, but I can't remember mm. off the top of my head which, which of the carriers it is. Brief, uh, continue a little bit on the hardware because I wanted to introduce to the uh, to the anti-aircraft guns that uh, the Italians deployed against these uh, torpedo mm. bombers. Because it's also a subject covered in the book, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. We 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 go into the hard uh, the hardware, so we look at the mm -hmm. the ships, the aircraft, and the yeah. weapons that were deployed by. Mm by both so yeah. uh, the torpedo so, and the anti-aircraft guns i think were quite quite an interesting section yeah. of that because the so the italians uh embarked a large array of of uh no large not, not a large array a different array of uh, mm. guns these uh that we have in the pictures are the 37 millimeter uh breda uh machine cannons, machine guns, because in the, the, uh, the Italian Navy jargon, they are called mitragliere, which is kind of a heavy machine gun, but they are in, uh, like auto cannons mm. um, in twin mountings. The, in the picture on the right, you see it beside uh, 300, three, 381 millimeter shell from, uh, from a Littorio battle, class battleship. And these were actually uh, very good guns for the... Uh, they, they had an optimal range, I think, of between 
400 4000 4, and 5000 meters so they they equipped uh, the heavy cruisers the they were present on the battleships later in the war they mm, began to put it on the destroyers because uh, the destroyers of course carried uh, much lighter guns and uh, like these are the 20 millimeter uh, machine guns or cannons however we want to call them and the uh, all the ships used to carry uh, twin mountings of these heavy machine guns. These are the uh, Breda 13,2 um, millimeters machine guns, which were the classical uh, anti-aircraft guns mounted on submarines, but also equipped the uh, the, the, the destroyers and uh, the cruisers. But then, of course, these proved to be... Uh, not up to the to the time as um, airplanes developed, uh, become bigger, become more, became more resistant, and so on. So these were progressively updated with the twenty millimeter machine guns, and in some occasions the the twenty millimeters were, uh, or even the torpedo tubes on some of the destroyers were replaced with these uh, uh, thirty seven millimeter machine guns. Also, curious uh, uh, thing the um, on the Zara class cruisers which carried four twin uh, mountings of 100 millimeter guns uh, anti-aircraft guns they removed the the two mountings placed towards the um, the the stern of the ship and they replaced each mounting with two twin mountings of these uh, 37 millimeter uh, heavy machine guns so these were, let's say, uh, the the main weapons used, the main light weapons used for uh, anti aircraft anti aircraft fire. Mixed uh, uh, evaluation, mixed uh, uh, perception on this because uh, some of of them uh, were not sufficient for, of course, countering. Uh, dive bombers uh level bombers were a bit more useful for uh countering uh, torpedo torpedo bombers then moving to the heavier guns we have the the already mentioned 100 uh, millimeter twin guns that were present basically on every uh cruiser they were present also on the cavour class battleships and they were built from uh, actually an, an Austro-Hungarian design. They were they took the design of the Skoda guns the, the developed in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they um, they equipped most of the cruisers of the of the Regia Marina. Their problem was that uh, the the rate of fire became not sufficient for the the barrage required for. Uh, World War II style operations, and they also the um, the elevation was uh, I think uh, maximum plus eighty five degrees something like that. So it was could not be elevated to ninety degrees, and so was less uh, capable. In fact, the uh, subsequent uh, uh, heavy anti aircraft uh, armament. Uh, took the shape of the 90 slash 50 uh the 90 millimeter guns uh developed uh, by um, Otto and Ansaldo that equipped both the the Lito they were designed to equip the Litorio class battleships and then they eventually ended up also on the rebuilt Duilius. They were very good weapons, uh good elevation, uh, good rate of fire, I think 12 uh on paper. 16 rounds per minute of course in real condition was a bit lower around 12 or 13 rounds per minute they 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 were excellent guns and they also uh, gave birth to the uh, land uh, counterpart the 90/53 uh, gun their only pro problem was the stabilization system because they the Italians designed a very complex uh, stabilization system for uh, these guns and that caused uh, some failures during the uh, lifetime. And that that was the, the main issue of the of these guns. But they were overall judged as uh, very very good weapons. I gather they had more trouble on the um, the Duilio class mm. um, yeah. than the Latorios on the basis that I think as you can see on that photo there on the Latorio, they're on raised pedestals. Um, so uh, it's it's the, the the four guns you can see just sort of. Below the 
or four turrets you can see just mm -hmm. just sort of below the level of the uh, the the, uh, the boat deck um, by the funnels, um, but sort of between the bridge along the funnels. And um, th I think they got very um, in any kind of heavy sea on the Duilios where they were they weren't mounted mounted on the pedestals. They were just sighted directly on the deck. That tended to flood all the the mm. turrets and 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 ruin the electrics and uh, yeah, I true. think didn't they have the the, the stabilization removed on uh, on the Duilios? yeah or or disable at some point yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and here actually they are they are in the process of fitting the the barrels if you see that the the turrets are there but the barrels not yet it's in the oh, okay. completion uh, of the of the litorius mm. and uh, and then you see above the uh, the ninety millimeter gun turrets you see the this this deck with the twin uh, 37 millimeter Breda machine guns. And, uh, and then brief, uh, here is a, a detail of the, of the 90 millimeter guns. And then we pass to the 120 millimeter gun. This was the main weapon used on the, was the main armament of the, the Italian destroyers. It was also used on the Cavour, class battleship for uh, anti uh, for, for secondary armament these weapons were obviously not designed for anti aircraft use but they uh, could be used for anti aircraft barrage their limitation of obviously was the elevation that was maximum 42 degrees something like that and and that meant that they could be used uh, only against uh, torpedo bombers flying low not against uh, level bombing or level level bombers or dive bombers issues with the ammunition so they were not the best uh, uh, guns for anti-aircraft use the, the thing is the, the italians never realized uh, a, a dual a true dual purpose gun uh, they, they all the, they always have uh, had the the anti-ship version and the anti-aircraft version of different guns i mean there's compromises on on both sides and obviously with the the british 5.25 inch gun um the fact that it it took a long time to mm. to get that gun really working um adequately um that was that present was... on the king george uh, the fifth uh, class battle right? yes um and i think it's it is sometimes blamed for uh or, or implicated in the the sinking of um of the prince of wales um which was you know it's possibly one factor but you know mm -hmm. um the, obviously later on it became very effective but it did take a lot of time and effort to to get that gun functioning just because of the increased complexity of a gun that can work as a um as a an anti-surface vessel and anti-aircraft yeah. uh, weapon so so there are and the, i think the germans found similar um um similar uh, issues with with some of their with some of their dual purpose guns but mm. um yeah no it was interesting and i think the certainly in, as well as the uh the director um side of the anti-aircraft defenses which is something that i found um, quite interesting looking into in the um researching in the book was um was the way that the the, the guns themselves and the way that the guns were operated and controlled during an engagement mm. um which again i think the um the the italian navy had quite had a fairly sophisticated director um system on the newer battleships certainly um uh and and cruisers uh, i think some of the smaller ships um less so but yeah the the at least the littorials had uh, an insane amount of range finders uh fire directions <laughs> <laughs> positions <laughs> Mm, mm. But I think it, it well, I, I, I'd be interested to see um, how effective it was, it was considered to be. Certainly when we come to Matapan, there's, there's certainly, um, I think the anti-aircraft gunnery is doing its job um, for the most part, uh, can, certainly compared to some of the earlier engagements. And this is something, again, that you can see improving throughout the war. And most major navies, I think, are, are putting a lot more um, resource and effort into anti-aircraft gunnery from ships. Um, most navies, I think, start somewhat inadequate and uh, and build up to to something that's a lot more formidable later on mm -hmm. in the war. And I think this is certainly the case. Um, certainly the case with the Italian navy. Um, yeah. But um, you know, again, no nobody's anti-aircraft uh, guns and systems were perfect, but but I think they all improved quite a bit. 
yeah. so where were we in terms of the um sorry no carry yeah. on it's your show no 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 <laughs> yeah we mentioned it many times so perhaps it's time to 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 talk about matapan the 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 torpedo bomber action and its consequences and mm -hmm. which is interesting and then uh yeah the uh, long story short the i want to say this for the for the for the english uh for the let's say the english speaking uh, public matapan is much it's 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 a complicated thing it's not just the the never the night clash it's uh, an operation of the Italian navy to aim at at intercepting the convoys running from North Africa to uh, to Greece, they uh, venture at sea with a large formation, which kind of compromised the element of surprise, which was never there because the uh, the Enigma decryption gave Cunningham the hint that something was going on. Uh, he guessed correctly that uh, it was uh, uh, an operation aimed at hitting the the convoys. So the the, the both fleet uh, are at sea. They there's an uh, an action uh, fought uh, near the island of Gavdos. Actually, this is the the day the day engagement, uh, which is known as the action of Gavdos, in which the the Italian cruiser in the in the in the first part of the morning they exchange fire with the with the British cruiser, the light cruiser from of uh, our rear admiral Pridam Whipple. He uh, runs away because he's facing a heavy cruiser. He has only light cruisers. And then the, the Italians uh, revert their course, trying to reunite with the with the Vittorio Veneto unseen. And then at some point, there's in the around 11 yeah, there's the second part of the engagement in which the, the, the Vittorio Veneto appear, appears on the horizon, fires on the, on the cruiser. The cruisers uh, run away again. The uh, contact is... is uh, is broken between the two naval formation and the torpedo bombers uh, appears. So what happens? Um, yeah, well, in the first strike, I think um, certainly the perspective from the British side is that that when the torpedo bombers arrive, these are the the albacores from uh, formidable, um, that that they save um, the the British cruisers from a potential mauling by um, uh, Vittorio Veneto, which um, I think um, uh, Yakino, uh, he, he turns and opens the distance slightly on uh, on, on the, the torpedo bombers appearing. Again, the first strike, um, no success. Uh, I mm -hmm. think they, I think as, as usual, they claim a hit, but, um, but, but there hasn't been one. Um, so they launch a second strike um, later on in the day. That's a fantastic photo. That's a Bolzano, mm -hmm. is it? Yeah, that's a Bolzano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which I think is a. I think well, I'm not sure which what kind of um, aircraft that is because there was there was some swordfish and some um, albacores, some some albacores um, taking taking part. Which again, I think this engagement really highlighted the difference in performance between the two because mm -hmm. the. Uh, the albacores were mostly able to get into the kind of position that they wanted to, whereas the the, the swordfish would tended to be, you know, certainly on one on one occasion on the second strike, uh, there was a section of swordfish which just kind of got left behind and, and had to sort of make an opportunity opportunistic attack slightly out of position. Um, but Lieutenant Commander D. L. Stead um, makes an attack on uh, Vittorio Veneto during the second strike um, and um, mm -hmm. he presses it home very closely uh, and um, he scores a hit uh, but is, is shot down as, as his aircraft mm -hmm. sort of passes close to the to the battleship. I believe um, he releases the torpedo very close like around 1000 meters uh, yeah from the battleship. He 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 can't, he presses home, presses it home very very close, uh, which which is is um, um, probably the reason he was able to get the hit, but also the reason he was shot down because he would have been well within the range of the short range um, mm. guns by that time. Um, so uh, so yeah, um, he's he's shot down. His, his crew is killed immediately, um, which then kind of that that sort of that strike is. Um, it really puts a lot of pressure on the, the British then to try and drive the success home. Um, and so I think Formidable is, is uh, tries to launch a third strike really into the evening by this point. 
Um, and also there are some swordfish which are flying over from uh, Malame in Crete. Mm. Um, so just to try and get as many aircraft um, as, as possible. Uh, and I think they were also attacked by Blenheim bombers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, there were there were definitely some some. Uh, I think also from Crete. If yeah, yeah, from right. Crete. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's some some RAF bombers which I think um, um, probably don't do an awful lot. Um, but but again, it's it's just seen that that when you've got a damaged battleship, particularly one of the modern battleships, there is a lot of pressure then to try and um, sort of finish the finish the deal because this is what again sort of go go into this in a little bit in the book which is this is the purpose of the fleet air arm or the this the fleet air arm certainly in the early part of the war is seen as having and its torpedo bomber force is seen as having two main functions the first function is to locate the enemy force and continue to report that to the surface ships and the second part is to try and damage and degrade the performance of the the enemy warships in order to make them more vulnerable to the surface ships it the the air the air part the fleet the fleet air arm is is not seen at this time as a ship killing weapon in its own right it is seen as an integral part of the fleet um mm -hmm. which is is intended to, to cause significant but not fatal damage to uh, and this is changing this view is changing as the war is progressing but this is very much one of the relatively few occasions on which the, the fleet air arm is is doing exactly what it's um has been created for slowing down the enemy right slowing down the enemy particularly it's its biggest and most powerful ships um and the, you know the mark 12 the Mark 12 Star torpedo, which is the one that's that's in use at the moment, um, is is not really capable of sinking a battleship, other than in in very lucky, very favourable circumstances. Um, but it's it's capable of causing some major flooding, just destroying mm -hmm. equipment, uh, hampering damage control efforts, that kind of thing. So we've got a situation where um, Vittorio Veneto, as as we've gone into earlier, has taken a, a bad hit. It, it's taken on a lot of flooding its stern is almost a wash but it's still mm. capable of moving um yeah. and i think it's capable of a fairly good speed at this sort of time as I'm, yeah I'm... the after um, immediately they stopped the engines for a while then they are mm. able to restart it in the space of an hour i think and they are already able to develop 14 15 knots then yeah. 16 and then eventually 19 knots mm. and this is for what uh, eventually will uh jeopardize the uh, Cunningham's plan because before uh, the the last uh, attack the the Pola gets hit the idea was to uh, intercept the the Italian battleship at night with the uh, mm. with the destroyers and so launch the torpedoes and attack yeah. the, the battleship at night that that was the plan the plan of course is jeopardized by the the, the following events which we will see in a while <laughs> sure sure um so the, uh, the third strike is launched, which includes um, in some aircraft from uh, from 815 Squadron, uh, Swordfish uh, from Malame, who are um, trying to coordinate with the aircraft from Formidable. And mm -hmm. I think, if anything, this, this hampers the operation slightly because they arrive before sunset and they try and stand off to wait for the yeah. albacores um, to, to arrive after sunset. And this sort of warns the the Italian fleet that there is another strike in the offing and it gives them a long time to prepare. And I think Yakino has, has assembled all his forces and, and really focused his, the formation on protecting Vittorio Veneto at this point and formed a very so, strong. Yeah. He has rejoined with the, the heavy cruisers of, uh, of Admiral Catania. So the, the Vittorio Veneto is at the center of the formation, uh, forward and uh after you have uh, two destroyers then the um, you have three heavy cruisers on both sides and then you have the the destroyer screen on the extreme uh the, on the, mm. on the on the right and on the left so it's a very compact formation it was meant to repel the the uh, torpedo bomber attacks because uh, yakino had embarked uh, a group of um uh, royal, um 
it, um, Italian deciphers. So they were able to decipher the, the British transmission. So they knew that the attack was coming. So they assembled in this formation. They, they, they prepared. Also, Yakino gave uh, some uh, orders to use the, uh, the searchlight to light blind the, the, oh, yeah. the British pilots. So it, it was... Um, a formation meant to protect the the battleship, which was the, the prize that uh, Cunningham mm. wanted to 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 get his hands on, and in a way it was successful because the no no aircraft uh, managed to penetrate the shield. the The lucky shot against the Pola uh, occurred because the I think the, the airplane uh, tried to 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 go to fly against the the battleship, but then. Before turning, it releases released the torpedo, and then it eventually it eventually uh, went through and hit the polar. Yeah, I mean, the, certainly the reports from the fleet air arm crews were that that uh, that that they just met a, a, a wall of gunfire. Basically, um, they 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 faced an incredibly um, powerful barrage that 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 they they tried to make a, a sort of squadron strength attack to start with and we just turned turned back um and couldn't get through so they had to break up into individual aircraft and try and sneak through and make individual attacks mm. um and, and this was this was incredibly difficult and and yeah. uh, in the end as you say quite late on in the uh, so they were you know you had these aircraft buzzing around for some time trying to look for a sort of weaknesses in the screen to try and sneak mm. through and and uh and break through and in the end the uh, and then you uh, you have it it's at night um so you you have the same sort of problems of, of identification that that you've had in in previous engagements and one of the things that that seems to hamper the british well the, the british consider that the italian cruisers and battleships look very similar um and um yeah, I don't know how true that is, but certainly, you know, there were there were similarities it's in the silhouette. Certainly perhaps. true for the Abruzzi light cruisers and the Cavour class battleship. They are very similar from the right. the design. So the right. so the, yeah, I mean, there were times when I think they didn't they 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 weren't sure whether they were attacking cruisers or hmm. or, or battleships. Um, and as you say, there's we're quite late in the engagement. Um, and we don't even know which aircraft it was because numerous aircraft claimed to have made attacks on on warships and and scored hits mm. there was only one major hit which was on the heavy cruiser polar um and which um it disabled it basically um, the, the, the tell me if i'm wrong the the british at this point were not aware that they had crippled the polar right no no yeah. um i think because uh, again all of the people who claimed that they'd scored hits um claimed that they'd they'd hit the battleship so i think mm -hmm. um i think there was a, a thought that they'd, they'd hit uh, vittoria veneto again um but but certainly yeah there was no um there was no knowledge at this point that that it was a it was a heavy cruiser that had that, that had been struck so i think again you have this as happens several times in these engagements is that there are slightly different forces and they aren't quite sure which one they're engaging at any particular time, or they might be looking for one and find another. Um, and, uh, and and that happened at Spartivento, and um, it, it as we as we find out, you know, they're not as far as they're concerned. There's the there's the main group of there's the main Italian force, and that's the yeah that's what's there. That's it. Yeah. So the. Just long story short, the Pola is crippled. It has the uh, engine room uh, flooded. It's unable to move. Uh, actually, the Pola is the second in the line. The first you have the Zara, then you have the Pola, and then the Fiume. The the Fiume makes an evasive maneuver to try to avoid the the, the Pola and avoid the collision. The then there's a quite uh, intricate series of signals between the commander of the Pola, Admiral Cattaneo commanding the, the heavy cruiser division, and then Admiral Iachino on the Vittorio Veneto. So the idea is uh, that the Pola can be saved because also the commander of the Pola requests the, um, the towing of the ship, which is a very hard operation to carry out. So imagine the, the, the towing of a heavy cruiser in... In enemy waters it's a difficult thing but 
still they uh, I think also Admiral Yakino thought that he they had to try uh, to to tow their ship back to to Italy because uh, almost one thousand men and a valuable heavy cruiser was worth a try. The decision to send back the, the entire division uh, it's because they expected to um, to still be in enemy waters the day after. So they imagined to encounter at least destroyers and maybe light cruisers. So it it, it made sense to to leave two heavy cruisers and uh, four destroyers with the with the crippled polar. Leaving back only two two destroyers, which already had um, range issues, they were running no on uh, on NAFTA, because this is another aspect that it often is uh, overlooked. The, the Italian destroyers had the major flaw, which was their range. Their range didn't allow them to operate so far, like in the Eastern Mediterranean, and this was perfectly uh, shown in the in this operation. So yeah, they go back. They eventually <laughs> encounter the the Royal Navy because they, uh, while while searching for the Vittorio Veneto, they spot on radar the the Pola immobile uh, at sea, and so this causes uh, Cunningham and all the all the um, uh, Royal Navy uh, ships to divert towards the Pola and see what's there. Cunningham believes that it's the Vittorio Veneto hit and. Uh, uh, immobile, immobile, but then they found out uh, it's the Polar, and then of course they see Catanius coming with his ship, and and then you have Bataban, which is uh, I hardly call it a battle because it's it's not a battle, it's a uh, it's a clash, uh, it's an ambush in the dark where the Italians have no chance to 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 stand basically, and they uh, and you have the loss of the the loss of the the three heavy cruisers and the two of the destroyers, while two others manage to to escape. Yeah, um, and it's, I think the the detection of the cruisers on radar um, was um, was the, the, the factor there. Um, but um, yeah, so obviously then you, you've got 15 inch guns from the, the battleships yeah. against, uh, you know, even, even a heavy cruiser can't really yeah, cope I, with with much of that um but vittorio veneto got away uh, which i yeah. think is has got to be regarded as a success for for the uh for the regio marina and and a, a failure for the um at least a missed opportunity for the certainly for the fleet air arm um yeah. who'd sort of done their part um you know they they on the other hand there was there was a sense that that, that there was a sense of disappointment in not hitting it again um, I think circumstances were such that certainly in the evening strike, they would have been very, very lucky to get a further hit on, on the battleship. But uh, mm -hmm. it was almost a, a sort of, it yeah. became a, a slightly lucky success for the Royal Navy. And it it, mm -hmm. um, it was a consolation that they got three heavy cruisers and and, and two destroyers, but um, which again, is, is as we've, we've mm -hmm. said, is the Regia Marina was less able to make good those sorts of losses than the Royal Navy, perhaps. But um, um, yeah, it, it was the, the fact that they discovered that that secondary force there meant that, that they were no longer pursuing mm. um, the, the the battleship. And again, it was um, uh, the the main force escaped and could could continue to act as a fleet in being. Yeah. Um, so. No, because the one of the things that uh, I, I've seen uh, some some years ago, I saw a book published, uh, Matapan, the Trafalgar of the Mediterranean. <laughs> it's it, that's bullshit because the I, I, I say it here now. I, I told you already, Matapan didn't change anything significantly on the strategic level because the uh, the the Vittorio Veneto was uh, put back in action in a very short period of time, and then. After Matapan, you have many other occasions when the where the Italian battle fleet ventures at sea, trying to stop the the convoys at Malta. They are mostly unsuccessful, at least in 1941. But then that's the the fleet thing being is still there. It still attracts significant naval assets to the to the Mediterranean, and the the flow of uh, supplies continues of course then there's the crisis of late 1941 but on a strategic level that doesn't change that much the italians 
are finally aware that the British are able to fight at night with battleships. They have already seen actions fought by destroyers and light cruisers, but they are not. They are now aware that they can fight also at night with battleships. So they they try to be more cautious when uh, uh, operating at night. They were already cautious at night because they, they they knew they were not able to to fight effectively at night. This change, but this also uh, kickstarts the very first the the. Not the very first, but the, the first serious attempts to train uh, for night fighting, also with uh, large caliber guns. They're not go very far, but they they try. So yeah, that's the my <laughs> the, 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 this thing I would like to, to stress. Uh, no, it's surrounded by a myth. Uh, also, <laughs> matter, but... you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's. Um... Yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, Trafalgar was was the the destruction of of two enemy battle fleets in one engagement um and even that the that war this, continued for another 10 yeah. years um but um yeah in this case it doesn't change anything strategically yeah um, at it, least it's... you could say uh, you could argue that trafalgar basically buried all the hopes that napoleon had for uh, invading uh britain but then still you had the austrians intervening but <laughs> let's not dig deeper in the, yeah, the but, napoleonic yes. wars <laughs> that's that's a whole other podcast um but uh, yeah yeah i mean it, it the 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 aim of the 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 ideal aim of the british is to try and knock out the the italian battle fleet as a viable force as a fleet in being so it can have a free hand in north africa and i think once it if it was able if it'd been able to do that then the war in north africa would have been over very quick you know would have been over more quickly in the middle east yeah. north africa arguably um and it wasn't um Italy's goal, I think, was to stay in the war. Um, uh, to, to, I don't think, I don't think there was. Did the, did the Italian navy ever hope to knock the British out of the Mediterranean completely? Was that a? Was that no? A... That the the directives set by the the start of the war clearly stated that uh, the encountering the British at sea in a, in a let's say what we call a, a decisive battle was possible only on favorable terms because mm. they knew they had very few value very few ships compared to their opponent and losing um tr try uh, risking to lose their very valuable battlefield in a, in a engagement uh, was not a useful thing to do mm -hmm. uh, it was useful to maintain the fleet in being blockade the mediterranean and keep the the supply to North Africa. That was the, the goal, not not risking the these valuable ships in a uh, useless battle. That was the the idea. And mm. similar to the um, because we talked about this uh, already with Alex, the, the the British started to to think uh, already from the First World War about uh, hitting the enemy fleet in the harbor with. What with torpedo bombers? Yeah, this developed, and they developed the the the, the, the fit around torpedo bombers, and so on. the Italians did uh, a similar thing, but uh, on let's say beneath the sea and uh, over yep. the sea with the yep. small uh, MIS torpedo boats yep. with the human torpedoes. They developed a, 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 an entirely different different concept. Yep. Done, the same capability. Uh, yeah, similar capability with the same. Uh, objective but using different means and um coming from the experience of the great war that was right. developed yeah. in the interwar years and uh, and the the attacks on the austrian battleships and so on yeah exactly yeah. but yeah, yeah the the decisive the decisive the decisive battle was never seen as a a thing that uh, mm. for mm. instance on uh the, the battle of calabria or uh, we call it in italy the battle of punta stilo mm. uh, the Italian admirals, they were happy how they, uh, we know that it was an inconclusive uh, uh, um, encounter on the tactical level. The thing is the, the, the Italian leadership was happy because they gave, uh, how could they say, a good proof of themselves. They behaved in a, 
good way against the most powerful navy in the world. Mm. And we have to remember that uh, at Punta Stilo, the, the Italians had two rebuilt uh, Cavus against three, uh, que- no, one Queen Elite, the, the Malaya, the Royal Sovereign, and the War Spite, which mm. were on paper uh, better armed and uh, yeah. more protected. They were slower, but yeah. superior capital ships uh, compared to the to the Cavu. So Campioni uh, demonstrated uh, uh, quite of a degree of uh, aggressiveness there, mm. Mm. and they behaved well. They stood the stood the fight, but then they also evaluated that they had nothing to gain from these kinds of uh, engagement it was just losing valuable ships that they were not able to replace that's yeah. the, the point yeah i mean you have to keep the supply lines open yeah. um and if you're doing that then anything else is secondary i think um and um yeah i mean it, it i think the, the the fleet air arm um scored a number of tactical successes against the italian navy but was never able to um to secure that uh, or, or facilitate that knockout blow that I think was desired. Um, and I think it had, it was potentially in reach on one or two occasions. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, I think they, they proved themselves well. There were, there, there was a cap- the capability of, yes, they, they had intended to do the, um, the attacks on, on the battle fleet in Harbor in the first world war, that had sort of become a secondary thing throughout the interwar period, but that was then um, revived uh, really sort of d- during the war and they, and they sort of made something of a specialism of it in the Mediterranean. Um, and, um, but then I think also it, it, it showed that the time was running out for the carrier based torpedo bomber in some respects in that, that mm. certainly Matapan did, the, the strength of anti-aircraft fire that was able to be put against the uh, the third raid in particular, well, and the second raid really, um, went to show that that it was less easy for um, certainly earlier in the war they'd reported much lighter uh, mm. anti-aircraft fire, less accurate um, yeah. and less coordinated, and and I, I certainly get the impression from the fleet air on perspective that the Italian use of anti-aircraft gunnery was was improving um steadily throughout that sort Mm of uh, you know the first two three years of the of the war um which was then eroding their chances for success um once you then got into things like radar laid guns later on then it was almost almost game over um but um uh so there were those chances which were were which were there earlier on in the war, but I think was was becoming less. And then you had the survivability of carriers in the Eastern Mediterranean, which, which once you had, again, very heavy, very specialised anti-shipping um, forces from from both the, the Italian and the German air force, then it became very difficult to to maintain a mm-hmm. carrier in the Eastern Mediterranean in any sort of meaningful way. Um, and so I think that was a sort of there was a sort of brief golden period that, uh, yeah. that, that it did achieve a lot tactically, but then t- strategically it didn't tip the balance in the way that it might have done. Because then, uh, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but Matapan is uh, one of the la- the last uh, action that you cover in the book regarding the Mediterranean because uh, yeah. Uh, after Matapan, you don't have any significant uh, uh, engagement of the fleet air arm in the, at least in the central eastern Mediterranean. You don't have any no. more carriers in the in the in that theater. You only have the the carriers of the Force Age coming to support the Malta convoys and so on. So the, yeah, so and you have some of the um, the carrier based aircraft are um, disembarked to Malta or, um, or or they're put under RAF control in the Western Desert, and they do good work in the Western yeah. Desert. Uh, they do good work from from Malta against uh, convoys. Um, you know, again, again, I think mm-hmm. sometimes that's overstated, but they they do. Um, you know, they are able to, to to have some success in that role. But but as a as a I, force, I think against... the, the the role of Malta based airplanes is overstated uh, yeah. compared to uh, the those planes based in Egypt, which are overlooked. I think. Yes, yeah, certainly the, the the aircraft based in in Egypt that that's really under. Um, 
underreported on and underappreciated. Um, but but you know, again, they're they're very effective. And I think partly this is again we've talked about the um, the the prestige of the swordfish versus the albacore. I think because the albacore is 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 in some of these lesser uh, some of these underappreciated areas is when it does a lot of its work is is why that why it's not seen in the same light as the swordfish um but it's the role as a as a as a major force of the battle fleet against an enemy battle fleet is is getting much much smaller over this time and really sort of late 1940 first half of 1941 is very much its heyday um and there are some attempts later on i think the last as a as a sort of touch on in the book the last strike or the last attempt at a torpedo strike against a a, a major enemy warship um is is from uh, from the orkneys against a, a one of the panzer shift um vessels uh, off mm. the coast of norway and, and they don't manage to make they don't manage to make contact and the opportunity's lost and that's that's the last sort of time in the war really um against a against a major enemy warship but it's it's an i think for me it's a fascinating period um yeah, and, yeah. and the sort of the technology and the tactics um and the way they develop and and it's this sort of relatively brief window which which allows this particular weapon to be used in a particular way and then it's gone um and you know the, the royal navy sort of pursues it but then there's there aren't the targets uh, and then it's it's facing different enemies and then you know it's mm -hmm. i think one of the last uses of uh the, the royal navy um torpedo bomber force in the Mediterranean is actually providing anti-submarine cover to the Italian fleet when it's on its way to Malta um, mm. in to, to surrender in 1943 in, in in September 1943 so so that's kind of an a slight irony that um, that, that it ends up sort of trying to protect uh, the Italian warships from from <laughs> torpedoes from from German submarines so you know it's just the, the irony of war I suppose but um, but yeah it, it's um, so so I you know I find it I, I find it really interesting um, I think the in the book we try and cover an introduction to it to try and give enough detail to be meaningful mm -hmm. but obviously there's an awful lot more that can be said uh, yeah. and, and can be written and i think there's there's a lot more that i want to go and research mm -hmm. as a result yeah. of it um yeah those but those books are very good i think at igniting the, the interest for a, a mm -hmm. topic that of course you can uh, read for ages and uh, but certainly uh bring some uh, more uh light and overshadowed uh events like the attacks on the libyan harbors uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the bomba raid uh, those sort of things which are not very much covered in the it, I, I think in the Eng in, in, in the english language but in the general debate of course you have uh, specialists and historians but then they have to make the effort to bring it to the to a wider public sure 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 yeah. and i think they're seen where they're seen at all as a bit of a sideshow whereas to, to to me they're they're an important part of the wider picture um but uh, but yeah it's um it, it's um i could uh, could talk about mm -hmm. it all day <laughs> yeah yeah maybe one one last question very very quick because just my, out of my curiosity uh, we have Gaudo and Matapan in, in March 1941. Mm. Uh, and the action played there seems similar to what the Royal Navy will do with Bismarck in May 1941. Is there any lessons learned uh, there or is just the Royal Navy following the, the, doc, the, the manuals and the, the doctrine in the, the, the Bismarck case? Um, yeah, I mean, well... I don't know if any any sort of lessons were directly transferred from um, from Matapan to the, the Bismarck operation. Certainly, I think the, the Bismarck operation can be seen uh, again as as something of a uh, distillation of everything that's been learned so far. And I think obviously there were the reports from the uh, from the, the senior officers, from the squadron commanders of the the aircraft involved. So I'd be surprised if some of that hadn't fed into the mm. into the thinking around the um, the Bismarck operation. Um, certainly there in in terms of you had some of the squadrons from Victorious, which were actually quite inexperienced, but managed to score a 
managed to score a hit and come away with all their aircraft. And in slightly different circumstances, you know, they, they were facing one ship rather than a, you know, a fleet with a, a number of vessels with supporting. I think had there been some escorting cruisers or destroyers, then it might have been, you know, slightly more difficult. Um, but certainly in terms of the way they coordinated the approach, again, that was very important to the success um, of, of dividing the anti-aircraft fire uh, and, and you know, forcing the, the manoeuvring to um, benefit one group as it, as it compromises another. Um, and also, you know, the benefit of, I, I think there were slightly different circumstances in terms of in that the, they could use cloud a lot more which obviously mm, is, tends to be less sure. of a factor in uh in, in the mediterranean um and uh, and use the sort of difficult weather conditions but um i would imagine that 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 there were there was certainly ex the experience was in the minds of the uh commanders obviously it was a different ship it was different squadrons uh, but sure. you know i i think it probably it, it feels to me the increasing effectiveness of the torpedo bombers at sea throughout that period leads me to consider that you know and then later on you have the, the an attack on turpits which is less effective um but, but that certainly over that short period that the, the less that the lessons are all being built up and 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 adding to the mm -hmm. the effectiveness but okay. um I, I i can't answer that straightforwardly but i no, I, no, no. I would be surprised if it was if it was not a factor Matthew, thank you very much. That was, uh, uh, I mean, time flies. <laughs> mm, yes, that was, sorry uh, about that. Very, no, no, no. That's uh, I could have stayed here for for the entire evening, but uh, then the 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 people watching us get could fall uh, could fall uh, behind. But uh, I hope some of them are still here. I, I did, no, no, no. <laughs> the thing is, I I have uh, I have done uh, three hours long live shows, but oh. I, I see that maybe people are. Uh, less inclined to follow longer shows, but so let's try to reduce a bit the length mm, <laughs> of this mm. show. But it's it was fascinating and uh, ni very nice. So I will put uh, the link to your book in the description so people can get interested uh, in this uh, topic. Thank you very much for being here, and I hope that this won't be your last uh, appearance. <laughs> no, no, I, I enjoyed it. I'd uh, be delighted to come back. Um, yeah, uh, maybe next time we, we, we could talk about Malta more in detail. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah? No, I, I'm happy to know Malta convoys and so on. That would be great. Good, good. So uh, thank you to the people who are still uh, connected, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.